Hi, everybody. My name is Rebecca. Welcome to this holiday season webinar. We'll be discussing how you can turn your holiday shoppers into returning customers. For anyone who's um, on the ball today and joined us bang on time, that's brilliant. But we will give just two minutes to allow others to get a Bright Talk account and to join us. Okay, we're going to get started with just a few housekeeping points first of all. Um, first things first, there's a questions tab at the start of your viewer. I do encourage you to please ask questions at any time and our presenters will then answer these at the end of the presentation. If anyone has any sound issues, please let us know via the questions tab at the top of the viewer. Also, you will be prompted to rate this webinar at the end, so please do take the time to do so as this, will feedback, this feedback will shape our future webinars. The webinar will also be recorded and we will email this out to you all before the end of the week. If we don't get the chance to answer all of your questions today, there will also be contact details for us in this email. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our four presenters today. First up, we have David Wise of Magento Commerce. He's currently the Head of Strategic Partners at the Digital Commerce Platform. Then we will have Skip Fedora of .mailer. He's identifiable as the um, American accent on today's webinar. Skip, however, runs the client services and consulting department at .mailer. We also then have Tom, who is an e-commerce consultant at Nosto Solutions. These are the personalized shopping experience experts. And then finally, we will have Henrik Mebius, who is the e-commerce strategist at Vimo, and they deliver omnichannel e-commerce websites on Magento. Now, it's looking like a few more people have managed to join us. So to recap for those of you who joined as I was introducing our presenters, you've joined the webinar on turning your holiday shoppers into returning customers. And over the next 45 minutes, we'll have four short presentations for you, followed by a Q&A session. Now, first up is David, who will share the latest holiday benchmark report created by the analytics module from Magento. This uses real customer data, and his talk will show that using data within a flexible platform enables merchants to make the right decisions for their personalization and omnichannel marketing. Over to you, David. Thank you. Hello and welcome everybody to this webinar. A quick bit of background. The reason why this came about is because as companies, we all work on the same customers together. And we realize that in doing so, we're able to give those customers the ability to be able to reach out proactively to their customers to drive them towards their own website and to personalize that experience in a dynamic way. And so what we hope you get from this webinar is a learning and understanding from some of the latest data points and how we fit together in that puzzle for you. The e-commerce holiday customer benchmark, this is the second report done the other one was done a year ago by a company, RJ Metrics, which Magento bought earlier this year. Um, what this has done is taken the real life data from Magento uh, sites and 
taken it in a context of real customer data to learn about what's been going on in the buying patterns of the end customers for our, our merchants. So what's the annual impact of the holiday season on an e-commerce retailer? And that's a very interesting question because there are two types of uh, actual holiday sensitive categories. And what I mean by that is that depending on what you retail as a merchant uh, depends on the way that the your customers respond to that and whether they're more prone to being seasonal customers or they are simply more general customers would buy throughout the year. And so if you look at this slide, you'll see that on the left is the holiday sensitive retail categories. So things like computers, electronics, apparel, accessories, all those kind of areas where you'll typically expect to see not just a run rate during the year, but also a spike in the amount of demand for your products. Holiday insensitive categories are food and drug, health and beauty, any products that are consumed more throughout the year on a general basis. Obviously, within those categories, there'll be certain areas like health and beauty, like fragrances that will spike up. There's a general that you can start to see whether what you sell is holiday sensitive or holiday insensitive. And, and what the data shows is that of the percentage of annual revenue from the holiday customers, clearly the holiday sensitive retail categories have a bigger proportion. But what's interesting to note is that you probably expect that blue bar to be higher. If you are a holiday sensitive uh, merchant selling, uh, selling things to, to people that are more likely to be bought during the Christmas season, you'd expect there to be a much bigger difference between the holiday insensitive. And so that tells us that the impact of Christmas can last much longer in terms of being able to acquire or the opportunity to acquire net new customers. And so how valuable are holiday customers? Are you just giving away your business in order to be able to uh, get those customers, but then find out that they're not going to deliver much value to you for the rest of time? So if we look at the graphs here, what we'll see is that non-holiday customers outperform just. So again, the, the difference isn't quite as marked. So you'll see that from an average order value, that the non-holiday customer has uh, $78.58 uh, in terms of average order value. The holiday customer, slightly lower. Okay, now this is partly because people who are the holiday-related customer, they may not be one of your regular customers, they might be buying gifts for a friend. And so you wouldn't necessarily expect them to come back to your site. And so, as a result, the number of orders, if you look at it, it's less for the holiday customer. But again, it's not significantly less. There's only 7.2% uh, difference. But that nets out to a customer lifetime value difference of 13%, which means that that's quite a gap if you look at your profitability and the amount of extra money that you can make. So, what it tells us is that both categories of customer are really important, not just to take advantage of during the holiday period, but also after the holiday period where you can really go back and so that leads to the question when should you remarket to holiday customers and what this graph shows is that long tail of what a customer does so along the bottom axes we have uh, days since first purchase and it goes right beyond a whole year into equivalent of uh, january of the next year and so you'll initially see that there's a, there's a high frequency, but then 30 days after, there is a spike in repeat purchase. So this is your golden time to get more of those customers by marketing out to them to be able to win them back because you know that when they come back, there's a real opportunity to, to get them for longer and to increase your, your customer lifetime value. And so what you'll see from a percentage wise is when was the next purchase made? So 38.7% were in the same holiday season, and 42.4, that's a large group, were following the off season, okay? And then following on from the holiday season, 7.2%. And then if you look a year later, who came back then? 11.7%. Now, if you increase the relationship and the experience that you deliver to your customer, 
as a positive experience of regular communications, you can expect to see the, the purchases increase and more repeat visits from your customers, particularly the ones who have signed up. Because what we do know from the holiday season, it's a golden period to acquire net new customers. We know that they're not quite as profitable as the traditional customers, but they're still profitable, and that enables you a real opportunity to market towards them. So that's the key message. It's an incredible time for acquiring new customers. And what we see there is that Retailers, depending on whether holiday sensitive or insensitive, between 29 and 59 percent more customers during the holiday months. So unless your products really don't play to the holiday season, it's a good idea to be one thinking about how you can really attract and acquire them, but critically how you can then go on to add more for the lifetime value. So whilst customers have a 13 percent lower lifetime value, they do have the ability or retention as long as you start to create that relationship. And that's the key part. It's the revenue reliance. So holiday sensitive retail categories generate 24% of their annual revenue from holiday customers. But make sure that you then look at your customers who have just joined to go after that longer tail to increase the repeat purchase and the relationship you have by delivering a great experience on the site when they get to it or on the mobile device. As a, as a final piece, so applying this research to your business, this was taken from uh, Magento Sites data and uh, we also offer the ability to, even if you're not on the Magento platform, to review your data and, uh, and give you some similar kind of insights into what's happening in your business. And this is a free service for uh, certain customers, if they, they fit the right criteria to be able to get the right data out of the system. So you can follow up with any of us there to ask more about that. Okay. So now that I've shown you why holiday customers are different and are the perfect group for remarketing to increase their customer lifetime value, Skip at Dotmailer will give some tactics for using email marketing to generate that next sale in the new year. Thanks, David, and some great stats there. Um, and hello, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, and you know, at this point, I'm I'm kind of over Christmas, uh, and I'm really much more interested in what your your plans are for Valentine's Day. But I'll get back to that in just a second. Um, and I, I guess I don't want to sound too much like a Grinch, uh, and, and I am actually quite excited for Christmas. But as this uh, as I see this truck every year, it brings a little bit of dread. Um, you know, I'm sure many of you, as soon as this image came up, started humming the song, you know, the holidays are coming, holidays are coming. That's going to be stuck in your head the rest of the day, and, and I apologize. Um, but this truck isn't delivering necessarily the holiday cheer or the, the Diet Coke that's become a bit of a trademark for me. No, not at all. This truck is bringing with it the stress of one of the busiest times of my business year, as well as the stress of getting just the right gifts for the women in my life, you know, my wife, my daughter, my, my mom, not necessarily in that order, it depends on who I'm talking to. Um, so what this truck really signifies is despite the best laid plans of last January, how I was going to get ahead of my Christmas shopping and have it all done before November, and how all of my Christmas uh, or all my clients' Christmas marketing plans were going to be buttoned down and ready to go before the beginning of November, uh, what I see when I see this truck is I'm actually probably not as ready as I'd like to be yet. So, a couple of things about email. Uh, email is the most popular channel for consumers to maintain relationships with brands by over two to one across all age groups. And these, this is based on UK consumer data, uh, done uh, some research done by the Direct Marketing Association. Even those pesky millennials that supposedly never use email prefer email by more than two to one as a way to maintain relationships with brands. Email is especially important during the holidays, as this stat shows. It just drives more revenue than it does in the non-holiday months. This could be because everything drives more revenue in the non-holiday months, but because email has doubled the popularity, it's got, there's a much higher potential for it to go wrong. 
And because of that, email is also one of the most popular channels with marketers, and it, it all comes back to you because it delivers the highest ROI. So it's not surprising that we ramp up our email cadence over the holidays, but the good news is, as the statistic shows, that our consumers are also happy with that increased cadence. They're happy to engage. So in case you've been hearing that email is dead, I can assure you that email is very much not dead. Now, all that said, Christmas is more than just taking your normal creative and chucking some snow or holly or a silly hat at it. You know, I recently saw a stat that 23% of all new customers that you're going to attract this year will come in over the holiday season, but barely, barely a quarter of those will go on to make a repeat purchase. That's such a hugely wasted opportunity. So it is important to remember that just like a puppy, a customer is for life, not just for Christmas. So how do we begin to build these relationships? Well, we do it like we build any relationship, any interpersonal relationship. We get to know the new customer over time. We get to know their likes and their dislikes. We get to know what interests them uh, what, and what relationship they want to have with our brand. That should be pretty easy, and it's conceptually, you know, it is pretty easy. It's only when you remember that each new customer will be going through this process from a slightly different start point, varied start times, and at their own pace that the complexities start to emerge. You know, it's easy to have a conversation with one, 10, or even 100 customers. In fact, the maximum that you could manage uh, to maintain a relationship, relationship with is about 150. This comes from research uh, that a British anthropologist, a guy called Robin Dunbar, um, did, and it's called the Dunbar number. And it's the number, uh, the maximum number that we can, of relationships that we can maintain. He came up with this by studying social primates and correlated brain size to maximum social group size. So for humans, anything over the 150 mark is where we start to need help. And you can see this in all kinds of situations. Think about a small company that you once worked for when it crossed that 150, 160 employees. All of a sudden, the wheels came off the bus until some processes were put in place, better communication started to happen, that you, know, you could no longer manage the, the company from the pub. But as marketers, we regularly have to maintain individual conversations with one, 10, or even 100,000 customers at all at the same time. And so for this, we need technology to enable these conversations, and that technology is marketing automation. And when we start to map this automation out, we very quickly get to a point where we exceed our ability to deliver. Let me tell you about how this experience played out even within .mailer. You know, we do marketing automation, we should have probably known better, but what happened was we decided, hey, we should have a marketing automation program. We should do email marketing automation. So we got the best brains in the company, and we sat down in our boardroom, and we put all this sticky plastic up on the walls, and we whiteboarded out this whole thing. And it was amazing. It was such a great afternoon. And about 4 o'clock, you know, we got a couple of some beers in and some wine, and then the ideas really started to flow, and it was really, really exciting. And there was this one young lady sitting kind of in the corner, not saying a whole lot and not participating a whole lot, and... As a facilitator, I, I thought, well, I need to get her involved. So I said, I said to her, what's, what's wrong? And she said, I, I, I don't have time. I didn't have time to come to this meeting today. I certainly don't have time to come up with 47 new emails. And what she had done is she had counted the number of end nodes that we'd come up with, and it was 47. And she was right. She didn't. And we never did implement the, that entire program fully. So the takeaway from that for me is kind of this mantra that we now live by as a business. And that mantra is very simple. We encourage all of our clients to think big and think as big as you can, but start small, scale quickly, and most importantly, continually optimize. Marketing automation is not a fire and forget kind of a tactic. You have to launch it, refine it, make it better, and move on, and then come back to it again. Some have described this approach as agile marketing. For me, that sounds a bit too buzzwordy, but um, I, guess, I guess it fits. So we've got a white paper about the 10 marketing automation programs that every e-commerce company should have, but 10 seems like a daunting number so, to a lot of people. So we've reduced it to six, and these are the bare minimum. But in the interest of time and, and the season, I'm only going to focus on these three for today. So the first is the welcome program. This is the email equivalent of the first conversation. It allows us to make sure we have enough information to have an interesting conversation, start to build a relationship with the recipient, 
but also avoids us from going into the land of that creepy question guy that you tend to find on the C-list tables at weddings. While they may seem like a throwaway communication, they are a great example of why you need to continually optimize. People that read at least one welcome message in a series will end up reading more than 40% of the messages from that brand during the following 180 days. And welcome emails have a 320% more revenue per email than other promotional emails. So these are your best possible targets. These people are hot, and you got to strike while the iron's hot. Not treating your welcome program seriously will leave you in a really, really big hole. It almost leaves you in a situation where you shouldn't have collected the email in the first place. So what's a good welcome program look like? Well, very simply, start with say thank you. Why? Somebody's given you their data. They've trusted you with it. So you should say thank you. Next, educate them about the brand, other ways to keep in touch, a wider variety of products and services. You know, in, in this example, uh, I love the line, nice to tweet you, and I recognize your Facebook. And lastly, get them back to the website. Either incentivize them to buy or encourage them to buy. If you don't sell online, encourage them to come back, download a white paper, whatever it is. It doesn't matter. These, all these tactics apply both in B2B and B2C. The second key automation program is going to be your post-sale email. This, again, this is first and foremost an opportunity to say thank you and say it properly, not with the kind of you know, system-generated um, email that says you know, confirming the order. This is, hey, we really appreciate your custom. We're really happy that you bought this, and this is what's going to happen next. It's going to take us three days to pick it. It's going to take us five days to ship it, whatever it is. This is your chance to really, really make the customer feel like you care, like you didn't just take their money and we'll ship something out if and when it suits you. And again, it's a thank you. They've parted with their hard-earned cash. What did your mom teach you? Say thank you. So don't let your mom down at Christmas. So here are a couple of examples of post-sale emails. Hopefully, there's one. Um, now this is actually a post-sale email, but it's also a physical post-sale email. So this is from uh, the theater in South as well, and it reminds you of the evening. It talks about the reviews of the evening. It shows you some of the tweets. Again, for them, you've already had the experience, right? But you can, uh, you can kind of relive it. They could also do something right after the ticket purchase. purchase. This is what you're going to see. This is how great it's going to be. This is how, what you need to think about to get to the theater, that kind of stuff. This is a more traditional um, e-commerce email, but a great example of starting small. This is a thank you. All they say is thank you. Now, I got this from one of my colleagues. She's redoing her bathroom. And she's bought loads of individual things from uh, Victoria Plum, loads of individual transactions. They could start to talk about, hey, thanks for buying this, and have you thought about maybe these other three products that go with that? But they started really simply with, hey, you bought something. Thanks a lot. I'm sure in the new year they'll do something to uh, make that better. Now, last but not least is the meat in your thank you sandwich, the abandoned cart program. Now, most of the research that I have, I've seen indicates that carts are not abandoned because customers are kind of shop, continuing to shop or looking around for a better deal. Usually, usually there's a much more prosaic reason, such as they got distracted or they need to get their wallet and then got distracted, or their boss walked in. Um, that one happens to me quite a bit. One in five purchases are abandoned. However, 63% of those can be recovered. And of the email, abandoned cart emails, they get this tremendous open rate, like 46, 50% open rate is not uncommon. So the abandoned cart email, if you did nothing else, is probably the, the most important thing that you ought to be doing from a marketing automation perspective. And here's a great example from Nike. Um, you notice I use the American pronunciation of Nike there because that's, you know, how it's pronounced. Um, the, uh, but anyway, sorry, little soapbox moment there. Um, but, you know, what this email does is the first one reminds you what's in your basket and gives you some other alternatives. The second one is a little more forceful, but essentially does the same thing. Now, I can almost feel the stress coming over the phone um, a lot of people thinking, oh, skip, but hang on, wait. Um, actually, I, I can hear the Coke truck, right? I can hear the Coke truck, I can hear the song, and, but now you're seeing me as the driver of the Coke truck. 
happily delivering stress around the land willy-nilly. Now is not the time to panic, nor is it the time to start building out your automation programs. So if you don't have one, don't freak out, but don't think, hey, I know what I'm going to do next week. You're already into your busiest trading season. Probably best not to implement some new technology just this very moment. That said, there are some things you can do over this season to ensure strong relationships or you start to build strong relationships and maintain those throughout 2017. In fact, even if you do have your automation all sorted, you might want to think about some of these techniques because they will ease people into that relationship. Which takes me back to Valentine's Day. Imagine this scenario really quickly. It's the Christmas season, you're going to lots of parties, and you meet somebody new, right? You're single, and you meet somebody new, and you are sure this person is your soulmate. You are sure this is the one. This is the one you instantly want to take home to meet your parents. You don't mind going to meet their parents. They are the person with whom you want to spend the rest of your life. But it's Christmas. You're busy. They're busy. Are you going to try to... You're like, you're the one. Let's go out on New Year's Eve. No, they were probably busy on New Year's Eve. If they're that great, they've already got plans for New Year's Eve. And all you're going to do is irritate them if you pester them, right? Sure, maybe you send a text, maybe a couple of WhatsApp messages, but you let it lie, right, until January. Now, funny enough, I'm kind of giving dating advice. My wife would tell you that I was rubbish at this, but go with me. You let it lie till January. And then what you want to do is rebuild that relationship and try to, try to get the date for Valentine's Day. So, how do we do that from an email perspective? First, definitely don't batch and blast. Don't just throw them into your email program and start hammering them with emails. They've already bought something from you. Just let it lie, right? If you've got a really awesome offer, maybe you include them in that. But just let it, let it be. Treat your customers differently. Treat the people that have bought slightly differently than the people that haven't bought. You know, if you've got regular customers that haven't bought or people that have bought every holiday season from you for the last three years and they haven't bought yet, definitely email them. Email them a lot. Get them to buy. But once they've bought, ease off. Just take it. Step back. It's a really, really simple piece of segmentation to do. And then reconnect with them in January, right? <clears throat> You'll have plenty of time. Send them a really, really nice thank you note in January. Hey, thanks for buying up with us over the Christmas period. Thanks for... Um, your custom. We really hope you had a great holiday. Here's a little bit, a little incentive to maybe get you to buy something for you. Because you know, even though we all have this fantasy that people are buying gifts over the holiday period, we know that the biggest percentage of people on Black Friday buy for themselves, not for somebody else. So with that, I'm going to pass you over to Tom, who's going to talk about personaliz per bleh, sorry, personalizing in other channels. Thanks, Kev, and thanks for joining us this afternoon. I just wanted to take a second, first of all, to kind of refocus on, some, on why we're here. So, as you can see, Q4 is big, big business in the UK. 24 billion being spent during this quarter, 5 billion of which over the side of the weekend. Now, if you consider that's an increase of 16% in 2014, it means that we're nearly hitting a half of all of that uh, quarter's revenue from two years ago in just that, that one cyber weekend. So making sure your automation is all in place and having everything ready to go is, uh, is one thing that obviously Skip's been chatting about there. Um, if you consider car abandonment rates are around 80%, so anybody on the call who's less than that can sit there feeling a little bit smug and everybody else needs to pay a little bit more attention to a couple of the guys that have already spoken today. The truth of the matter is that it's already begun. Um, we are, you know, well, well, halfway through, what's already been seen is uh, the, the busiest quarter, with 40% of consumers already starting by Halloween. Uh, it just goes to show that some people are out there really planning in advance. Um, it does mean that there's probably over half that will still leave it till the, uh, the, the last month of the, of the quarter, but um, it's all about maximizing the revenues from those people now and learning as much as possible as we can and take that information into the following quarter. So we heard from David earlier about the the golden 30 days post the first the festive period. What we need to do as marketeers is to keep those 65% of shoppers that are going to come back after Christmas and learn from their buying behaviors during the, the, the build up to Christmas and what they're actually up to, what they search for, what they're buying, 
what they're not buying, um, and obviously what they're leaving in their basket and leaving behind. All of that information should be built into your automation so that you can learn for it, not just for next year's festivities and planning your whatever your campaigns might be, but also in order to try and maximize that January shopping window as well. Personalization is one of the things which we can help to use as a tool, uh, build it into everything from your emails to your website, um, and also onto product feeds as well. So what we can see here is that 43% of purchases are influenced by these recommendations on sites or promotions. Um, we know that consumers expect this now, and this user experience and this personalization and marketing automation technologies, they exist to make it as easy as possible for merchants to be able to maximize their revenues, but the consumer doesn't necessarily know how easy these things are to implement. So making them feel special, making them feel like they're getting that sort of one-to-one, -one, that dynamic experience is something which we're here to help you to do, uh, and also will help you to maximize all of the, the data which you'll be collecting during this particular spike in that. Uh, in, in online behavior. So 86% of consumers say that personalization plays a role. Um, I, for one, have been put off from, from making purchases before whilst putting the time and effort into finding a, a, a website, searching for what I was looking for. It wasn't quite right, but then by not having a personalized experience, by not seeing alternative uh, products which would have been suitable, um, I actually left the site and, and ended up going somewhere else to go and make a purchase. So. We can see there that the stats don't lie. If 86% of consumers say personalization plays a role, it means that they're also then more likely to leave a website and not complete a purchase if they don't get that, uh, that sort of rich user experience that they become accustomed to on other websites. So Skip mentioned before that you know, it's all about having the, the right tactics to use during this time and, and um, went through the, the six different email uh, variations to use, but why not customize that experience? Um, you know, our abandoned cart email has had a 9% conversion rate uh, and a 30% click-through rate for Wakaku. Um, essentially what we're saying here is that without making that personalized content and without creating a uh, rich user experience, you're, you're, you're essentially just doing the blasting technique, which isn't going to work as well. Um, you need to be able to customize content and ensure that everybody that receives those emails from you feels the feels the festive love uh, and understands that you know, they are different to everybody else, even though we all know that this is actually just a very simple way to automate the process uh, and, and to maximize, again, the data that you guys have collected. A lot of the point from Skip and into what I'm discussing today is that there's more to life than just the email side of things. And sorry, Skip, and appreciate that this is with you guys, but we also need to be appreciative of the fact that about one in five minutes are now spent on Facebook. Um, if you consider that mobile sales are still only attributing about 1% of online sales, so uh, what we need to do is to make the most of the social media frenzy uh, and this increase in traffic uh, and look at other mediums, you know, look at other avenues for retargeting, for uh, approaching people with abandoned carts, uh, and for monetizing the, the, the different uh, mediums which are available to us. The particular example we're going to have a look at today, Eaton Shirts, and um, this is actually available on the NOSO website, so if you guys would like to go and download, or we'll try and follow up on that afterwards, you can see that by offering Facebook retargeting, we can offer a dynamic product feed straight into people's Facebook feeds. Um, obviously, there's a great return on the advertising spend there, and it's just a way of, sort of adding a little bit of variety versus the usual email retargeting, which again has incredibly good click-through rates as well. But by uh, by moving forward into uh, the dynamic Facebook retargeting on an abandoned cart ad versus an email, you can see that you can have up to 19 times return on advertising spent. So it's not about Replacing email is about complementing that as a tactic and ensuring that the customer is basically getting you know, the, the right message through the right medium depending on what they're currently using. Just a sort of last point for us here. What we're looking to try and do is to create a, a rich online experience and to um, basically try and A rich online experience to try and uh, convert and retain customers all the way through the festive period and into the month after it. Now, 
passing into Henry to look at a few of the customer trains to consider in the holiday period. Thank you. All right, let's uh, move on then to the next uh, topic here. Um, and um, I'd like to start on a note of uh, the modern consumer and, and um, who is this then? Well, it's really everyone that is living today and are affected by the enormous changes in, in society, uh, which is uh, you know completely dominated by technology these days. And in fact, we're in a technology revolution. Um, just um, take a look at uh, around us and think about you know just 10 years ago where we were, how we consumed media, how we worked, how we communicated, even how we you know how we dated. Um, just eight years ago, there were no iPhones. Seven years ago, no apps. Five years ago, no iPads. So, I mean, uh, seven, six, seven years is really, really nothing. And it's uh, happening extremely fast. Um, and take a look at ourselves and, and, you know, how poorly most of us keep up with these changes. And they also uh, happen in our minds. So anyone that works in sales or marketing, uh, understanding the consumer um, and these new traits are um, obviously key. So I'm going to talk today about uh, two things here, um, two traits and tactics. Uh, the first track is, you know, is about uh, small screens. You know, more and more people are using small screens, obviously. That's uh, quite clear. Um, but we're also lonely um, because mobile made us lonely. Um, and we have more friends than ever. Uh, uh, and and um, digital uh, friends are, you know, exploding. Uh, digital relationships are exploding, but we also have less friends. We feel more and more alone. So, um, starting then um, with uh, the small screens, I uh, just want to hit on that topic a little bit. This is the typical, um, a typical client uh, of ours in terms of um, statistics uh, these days. And where you can see that uh, the, the figures are a little bit out of whack here, but essentially, um, you know, more than 50% of visits and revenue do come through mobile uh, today. And um, see if I get forward. Next slide. Um, this obviously has a great effect on on you know this five-inch screen. Um, you know, how are we relevant when when it comes to to merchandising them? And one of the examples that I would like to bring up today is with our um, uh, client uh, Bauhaus, um, where they've uh, implemented uh, together with us in, um, in Nosto, um, and uh, you know on their mobile, um, it's really really hard to sift through thousands and thousands of products, um, and even if you have fewer products than that, it's still really really hard to be relevant um, on on that small screen. So with Bauhaus, we implemented Nosto, and here we are. Uh, get, giving examples um, or uh, giving uh, uh, personalized um, uh, recommendations based on their browsing history, based on others' browsing history. We, we give recommendations on, on accessories, on products in the same category, but also related items outside the category. So uh, make it a lot easier for the customers to find um, what they are looking for. Now, moving on to apps, because um, I think that that is really a bit, uh, you know, uh, interesting to say the least. And, um, you know, if you look at the, the, you know, the 200 times each and every one of us, uh, you know, takes out and, and, and start fingering on our mobile phones a day, um, we see a great activity on apps. And this means that uh, in fact, in, and this share is increasing. So, in fact, we have a dying web. Um, so we surf less and less, and more and more is, is goes through um, through apps. So, and and why is that then? Well, apps do it better. They're faster. They know it's me. They can chat. They can see. They can listen. They can do a lot of things that the web cannot do. So, um, let's have a look at uh, a couple of examples there. Um, starting with uh, that they're faster. Here's a quick example of where I'm going to open up one of our uh, clients' right store, uh, their, uh, their app on the right-hand side, and then um, on the 
left hand side, I'm going to open up the browser and go to their mobile friendly site. And um, so I start, um, you know, opening up the two apps, uh, the browser and the app, and then already while I'm still typing uh, the URL to the to the um, uh, to the site, um, the app is already uh, ready. It's launched, and you can start uh, using it. So two seconds. Then um, it takes a while, so um, before it's loaded, and it takes roughly 45 seconds. Um, so that is an eternity uh, today uh, to wait for something to load. From there, it's pretty much you know I have the pretty much the same uh, type of experience, um, except they know it's me. The apps know it's me. It's highly relevant. Um, when they uh, log in, uh, you log in for once, and then the app knows my purchase history, my bonus points, my favorites, um, and you, you can you just it, apps just set the standards and uh, do it by being extremely personalized um, uh, for the users. Moving on then uh, with. Um, Next example is, uh, you know, chat. That's uh, pretty straightforward. Everybody knows what that's all about. And they obviously can do that as well. Um, and they can see. And this is um, an example from one of our uh, clients where we implemented um, a bar scanning um, functionality in their app uh, so that they can build uh, the customers, their B2B customers can build the purchase um, uh, the purchase order uh, by scanning the barcodes. Very, very straightforward. Um, moving on then, um, talking a little bit about us being lonely these days, um, and it's something that I think we all, uh, you know, recognize ourselves in. And um, it's, it's a little bit of, of the sad parts about the new mobile era. Um, mobile makes us really lonely and disconnected. Um, and I think we all recognize, like I said here, uh, these uh, the types these types of moments. So, um, what what can we do about that then? Well, um, people are longing to to get a personal touch, get that human feeling, get that relationship with us as retailers. And here's a right store again, um, where they you know are listening on all channels. They are going in and and interacting with the customers on Facebook and Insta. Instagram, what have you. They even take it to the point where they personalize the the, the shipping message. So when they, they pack it, uh, the, the, the parcel, um, they fire away a text message uh, saying that, hey, you know, this is, hey, this is Anthony at Right Store. Uh, I just uh, packed your stuff. It's on its way. I hope you like it, slash Anthony. So you get that real personal touch um, in, in that conversation. So to be um, personal, to be relevant uh, on a five-inch screen, um, you, know, you really need to get the people to sign up, to get that email, and to be able to get uh, that experience for um, the customers. And um, there's obviously different types of sign-ups. Um, there's the newsletter, there's the user account, there's the customer accounts, but it's what, what I'd really like to urge is um, for all of us to, to consider what is the value um, that we bring to our customers when we ask them to give up their, their email address? What's the value to, to us as retailers and what is the value for them? Because there needs to be a balance and we need to use this information right. Um, because if you just, uh, you know, um, blast off and fire the incorrect or the non-segmented information or non-segmented uh, emails, to give an example, then of course we're going to get a lot of unsubscriptions uh, down the road. Um, so this is really important to segment your and work with your emails. Um, and um, here's one, one example from Dr. Denham, um, who's just about to uh, you know, set up this this um, uh, this pop up um, to catch more uh, email addresses uh, during this season, um, and they uh, want to uh, you know offer you know a ten percent off discount with the next order. 
What else can we do then? Well, um, pavers, um, our UK client, um, are using uh, um, social um, uh, login uh, to um, reduce the friction to uh, make it easier for, for their customers to log in. Um, very straightforward, and it, it is really a much easier uh, way to, um, to, to, to do sign up. They also use Amazon here um, as well. And then um, my final slide is uh, with a Swedish client, a true company at, um, who sells uh, outdoor stuff, uh, gear, um, garments and stuff. Um, and they um, are also, you know, uh, whenever they can, uh, really uh, recommend them there and explain them why um, their customers should log in, to have a persistent card, to get the favorites list, to get the easy checkout, to really, you know, detail that out. It's clear to the customers why why they should uh, log in, sign up, and log in. All right, so um, that was um, all I had uh, um, in my presentation. So I believe that that gives us some uh, some minutes for for questions. Rebecca. Yes, thanks, Henrik. And thanks everybody for uh, staying with us and, and listening to all of our presentations so far. Just as a, a quick wrap up, the stats show us that it's a great time to acquire new customers, but it's absolutely crucial to continue to provide a positive experience through your email messages, don't forget to say thank you, and when they get to your site or app, and of course make sure it's personal. So we now have a couple of minutes for questions. Now is your time to submit them on your questions tab. I'll give you just a couple of seconds to do that. And it looks like there's a couple coming through here. And the first is for David from Magento. So, David, the analytics that you referred to, is that a plug-in extension? So, yes, the, the analytics is, is actually a fully-fledged product that used to be available on the Magento Connect and would be on the Magento Marketplace and been integrated into Magento for eight years. And so it's a fully deep integrated uh, solution that we acquired, a lot of experience and background. But it's also a, a software as a service product. So it can also work on any other platform as well and pull data from any other e-commerce platform or other third party data feeds to be able to present you with a dashboard of your choosing something that the marketer and the business can use. You don't need a data analyst to do that. So it, it's a fully working solution that is an extension previously, but is now part of Magento. Okay. Thank you for that, David. And it's looking like there's another one through here that might be for Skip from Dot Mailer. How would you recommend segmenting your this new data that you're collecting during the holidays in order to email them? Well, as I said, you know, I think the last thing you want to do is just take somebody that you don't really know very well and dump them into your normal email program, especially at the holidays. You know, one of the early stats I showed was that we all increase our volume over the holidays and you prob that's probably not the best first impression you want to leave with somebody. They've just come to your site, they've bought you some things, some products from your site. And without any, even so much as a, uh, you know, hi, how do you do, to drop them right into your email program is probably not going to be, um, well, it's not going to position your brand in the best light. So it's really easy to identify who your new customers are and to exclude them, you know, very simply from your mailing. As I said in the presentation, if you've got a great offer, uh, a last minute deal, maybe you, you know, you're sending out your this is the last day to purchase and get Christmas delivery, then um, that you might want to include in your in, in include this new group pe people in. But I definitely wouldn't be sending them your normal marketing communications. Okay, thank you, Skip. It looks like we're having just a, a couple more questions come through here. So, Tom, this one might be might be for you. Um, can you personalize non-automated emails to give the same effect? Or should newsletters remain content rich? Tom, do you want to take that one? Yeah, so um, you can 
personalize on automated emails as well. Um, in fact, it's a very good tactic to offer in order to give that you know, one-to-one experience. Um, simply by adding a bit of HTML, um, you can create a personalized dynamic email content. It helps to break up uh, what otherwise could be something which is rather text rich or something which is very factual or information rich. So a great way to merchandise emails. Um, in fact, NOSTA have a, a great plug in with .mailer. So any joint customers out there should definitely have a chat with us if they were looking to do that over the season. I think just on top of that, um, I would challenge the notion of continuing to do newsletters. Um, I'm not advocating that you kill the newsletter altogether, but um, one of uh, I saw a great case study by the National Trust, and they did. They stopped sending their weekly newsletter and instead sent um, increased the cadence of their email. So they they would send a very you know a single topic email um, two two to three times a week. Um, now on the face of it, you'd, you'd say, well, that's crazy. They've increased the number of emails they send. Their unsubscribe rate must go through the roof, um, and you. Just the maths would tell you that across all of their campaigns, their open rate and click-through rates go down. But what they found was because they could be really specific in the subject line, it allowed people to opt in and opt out, wrong word, sorry, to, to self-identify whether they were interested in that topic or not, and then um, open and click through or just ignore it. And not only did their unsubscribe rate not increase, it, it fell, and their, um, their click-to-open rates went were a lot higher because people were able to self-identify. So part of personalization can be very simply not trying to throw everything against a wall and see what sticks. Yeah, on top, on top of that, Skip, actually, um, Harvey Nicks recently sent out an email which simply stated, we've noticed that you haven't been opening your emails lately, so would you mind identifying which topics are still of interest to you? Um, again, this, in the same notion, gives the, the consumer a chance to create relevancy in the, the automation and what they receive. Um, and again, kind of, kind of backs up what you're saying about rather than just sending lots and lots of emails, uh, creating something which is tailored towards each customer's needs. Thanks, Tom. Um, we have another one coming through here. And Henrik at Vimo, this might be one for you. It's about sending text messages. So where would where would you go if you're a retailer that was to find out how to send text messages to customers in order to notify them that their product has shipped? Um, yes, hi, this is Henrik. Um, thanks. Um, yeah, I would recommend you, you uh, contact us at Vimo, um, and we can uh, get you through and have a discussion around that and see how that can be. Uh, can be done. Thanks, Henrik. And actually, I have another one here for you, if you can stay unmuted. So, yep. you mentioned that apps are quicker. Um, I think it was 45 seconds you said, but does that 45 seconds really make a difference? Can you give an example? Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, um, imagine that your website would take it would take four to five seconds for a page to load. That's uh, you know an eternity, and and would I mean there's just so many uh, statistics st statistics on that uh, you know every second what it means in in terms of um, conversion rate um, and you know the, the decrease of the conversion rate. So four to five seconds is an eternity, especially these days where everybody is really really stressed and you have just a few moments um to to do whatever you're supposed to do so you don't have time to to wait so it's really i, I believe it's really really relevant uh, to, to consider this thanks henrik and i think we have time for maybe one or two more questions and i've got another one here for for david on the magento analytics plugin again so how is magento analytics different from from google analytics david Yes, so what our analytics solution is, is it enables you to take different data feeds. So Google Analytics is actually complementary to the Magento Analytics. The Magento Analytics tool is a business information data visualization tool that takes all different layers of data. So you could plug in your GA data, you could plug in Omniture data, into it and then what we do is take that data and represent it in addition to obviously plugging right into the core database of Magento so you can layer over and enrich that data to give you 
answers to questions, doing cohort analysis on your holiday shoppers, for example, or understanding your email success rates and presented in different views that make sense to the different people in your organization that need to see slightly tailored views. Brilliant. Thanks for that, David. It looks to me like that's probably most of the, the questions for now. Um, if you have any that we, we haven't answered, um, as I've previously mentioned, the, the webinar itself will have been recorded and this will be sent to you via email by the end of the week. Um, and I think our presenter has mentioned a couple of different um, case studies, so we will include include these references in, in that email as well. And of course, you can respond to that um, with any of the questions we haven't we haven't quite had time to answer. So um, thank you all very much for, for joining us today. We hope you found the, the content useful. Thank you very much. So now I'm going to end the webinar.